Well, welcome everyone to tonight's presentation of the Walter Street area around the Arboretum by the Roslindale Historical Society. I want to introduce George Wardell, who is conducting many great tours for us in the area and recently conducted this in a weather challenging day. And we're here to share the information for all those who want to know more about our area. So please enlighten us. I introduce to you George Wardell. So I'm a Rosendale resident I, since 1985. And if I look familiar to you, I may have sold you stamps in the square when I worked at the post office there for 15 years. So this area before the English settlers came was the land of the Massachusetts people. If you go to the Honeywell building, uh, there are arrow points and other artifacts that have been found there that have been found as the Arboretum was developed and diggings took place. Um, some of them go back to the late archaic period, which is three to 5,000 years ago. It was a sheltered spot that was good for hunting. This area was originally settled by the English as the town of Roxbury during the great migration of the Puritans to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They were persecuted in England for their religious beliefs. They were, unlike Virginia, where most of the people came just to find uh, wealth, these were already learned people who had, who came with their books and their uh, educations and needed to find shelter from uh, the persecutions that were going on in England. Now, these persecutions took place uh, only for a short period of time, and then the Puritans succeeded in England. And so there were over 10,000 that left to come to Plymouth Colony and to Massachusetts Bay Colony and to go to a Puritan colony in the Caribbean. And after the original rush of people, then it dried up to a trickle. There was a whole surge that happened in the 1629, 1630 that came to this area. There were six towns all founded in the year 1630, Boston, Cambridge, Roxbury, Dorchester, Medford, and uh, Watertown. So at the time, Boston was a narrow neck, connect, uh, was a peninsula connected to Roxbury by this narrow neck. Um, later on, when the back bay and the water here that becomes the south end is filled in, Roxbury seeds some of this land here to Boston. So up to like Copley Square had been marshy land that Roxbury gave up. Now, part of the theocracy that was the Massachusetts Bay Colony was that these towns were founded as religious parishes as well as the uh, municipality. And so originally, all of Roxbury, which extended to the Dedham Line, was part of the first parish of Roxbury as well as the town of Roxbury and required people to pay taxes to support the learned teacher in the town, who was also the pastor for the church and the meeting house for the town. And I, I kind of need to explain that to, so that we can understand how some of these uh, things happen in the history of the area that we're in now. So. The first parish of Roxbury extended from where I shown you on the map from the neck of Boston all the way to Dedham, squeezed in between the town of Dorchester and Brookline on the other side. It was interesting that of the original settlers coming to the town of Roxbury, many of them four shiploads full um, on the ship Lion 
came from the town of Nazing, England. So in some sense, the first parish of Roxbury is the second church of Nazing and included these families, the Welds, the Elliots, the Ruggles, the Curtises, the Heaths, the Paysons, the Peacocks, and the Graves. And these names stay important for generations in this area because they came, were given lands um, by the colony, and then they stayed for generations. I mentioned the Welds, and that's particularly important to this area because Daniel Weld was the eldest of four brothers that came from Nazing that settled in Roxbury. And he was uh, a teacher at the Roxbury Latin School. The youngest brother, Joseph Weld, uh, became a captain in the militia. And in 1637, was awarded uh, 278 acres by the colonial legislature for his participation in the Pequot War and in the subsequent negotiations that led to a settlement with the Pequot Indians. So Weld Street, where I live, it sort of ran through much of the farm. It continued through what's now known as the Arboretum, over Stony Brook, and on the other side in Forest Hills, all was part of the land uh, that was given to Joseph Weld and held by then his son John, and then son, uh, grandsons Eliezer and Thomas. And so this swath through, well, and let me point out on this map, as the town of Roxbury developed, the first two, the oldest two streets are Center Street, which ran from Fort Hill, where the uh, first parish church was, all the way through the town to Dedham, and follows this path through here, and on to Dedham. Later, a second road was added and that's south street and it started at the intersection of where the civil war monument is in jamaica plain comes down this way takes a right right turn here in what today is where the state labs are wanders through here um, comes out at rosy square comes up and ends up merging back with Center Street. Now, on the walk, we walked from Walter Street up to the burying ground, and it, it, it notes that that was established on the land donated by Captain Joseph Weld, uh, 1712, and is associated with the Second Church of Roxbury. So, between 1630 and 17. 12, there was enough Western uh, movement of population that enough people had settled in the Western end of the town, also known as the Jamaica end of the town, for them to want to have their own church and not have to go all the way to Fort Hill. So right on this uh, the side of Peters Hill, where Walter Street was cut through to connect to the church, uh, a church was built. Uh, they had to get permission from the first par parish uh, to take away taxpaying parishioners. Uh, at first that was denied. However, they had already built the building and so they pushed for it and humbly apologized. Their apology was accepted and a second parish was created in the town of Roxbury. So sometimes you'll see people wearing T-shirts or seeing other signs that says, Roslindale, founded 1712. Well, the origin of that date is the sense that here in Roslindale, this second parish, which was everything on the western half of the town of Roxbury, became separated, including half of Jamaica Plain and everything that's Roslindale and everything that's West Roxbury today. 
So that's where they get the 1712 for the T-shirts. Yeah. The original building may have looked like this. Uh, the historians at the Theodore Parker Church have put this in their literature as a sample of what might have been an early building with a thatched roof for the uh, simple church that was originally built. Standing where it was, I, I turned around and took a picture looking back at the flagpole where um, there's the stairs up to the Arboretum from Walter Street. And about here is where the, this was about where the church was with the burying ground on this side of the Arboretum. Now, let me jump ahead a little bit. By 1760s, there is interest by the people living on the pond plain in the Jamaica end of the town to have another church. And the third parish of Roxbury is, uh, uh, is desired. And they have to get permission from the people whose churches uh, I just talked about and the people from first parish to give up taxpaying parishioners. Part of the deal uh, that the people in Jamaica Plain, which is eventually what they call the area, uh, was to give some money to the people of the second parish because that original building on, the Peter, on Peter's Hill was not in good shape and they needed some help. So a payment of 666 pounds, 20 shillings was given by the people living on the pond plain to help to get an agreement to be released or set off from the second parish of Roxbury to become the third parish of Roxbury. This happens in 1772. By in 1773, the colonial legislature tells the people at the first parish of Roxbury that the people in Jamaica Plain on that side of uh, Elliott Street uh, up towards Fort Hill can also be released. And the third parish of Roxbury is created. That's the original building that's been replaced by the stone building there at the monument in Jamaica Plain. But what that allowed the people whose church was on Peter's Hill to do was to build a new church at Center and Church Streets in West Roxbury and becomes the West Roxbury uh, or the first parish in West Roxbury. And so they even take timbers from the building that was on Peter's Hill to build this building. So Church Street is just before you get to Holy Name Circle. It used to be where that where this church was used to be the location of the Theater Parker School, and then it was the Holy Name Parish Center, and now that's been torn down and they're building and they've built new houses there just in the last couple of years. So this becomes the second parish church. Then there's a fire and that burns down. And so that church splits and a group comes and builds the um, Rosendale Unitarian Church. Half the congregation uh, builds this church. It's on 850 South Street in Rosendale and is today uh, St. Anna's uh, Orthodox Church. And the other half that uh, builds a new church for the second parish down at Center and Quarry Streets in uh, 1900, after first building a building behind this on the same location in the late 1800s to be the new location for them. And then the Rosendale Church and the West Roxbury Church in 1962 merge, and now it's called the Theodore Parker Church. But on this map, you'll see 
here where South Street comes out and Center Street merged together, there's a church building there on this old map. And that's that second building that I talked about. So this is Center Street and here's Walter Street being cut down towards where the, the church is. And you have some of the later streets being put in, well, superimposed on it from the for the what's built at the Arboretum. But this farm here is Eliezer Weld's farm. He was the grandson of Joseph Weld. Here you have John Morey, his pasture. You have the heirs of William Dudley having the property here. John Davis has this property. And so before it becomes an arboretum, these are properties held by ma many different farms. Now, living on Walter Street is Colonel William Dudley. He's the grandson of one of the original governors of Massachusetts, uh, Thomas Dudley, who was the third, seventh, 11th, and 14th governor of the colony. They swap back and forth between Dudley, Winthrop, Endicott, and others. He was the founder of the town of Cambridge and on the committee that founded Harvard. And then he moves to Rock Roxbury in 1643 and helps John Eliot, with, um, who founded the Roxbury Latin School, and he helps fund the Roxbury Latin School. William Dudley's father, the, the in-between generation, he's also a governor of Massachusetts, but he's governor after the return of the, the king, and they, have, they break the original charter with the Massachusetts Bay, and Joseph Dudley is trying to, tries to uh, spread the Anglican church with, in Massachusetts and not part of the Puritan parishes. So his grandson moves and buys this land on Walter Street. He's not a member of the church at Peters Hill. He's attending one of the Anglican churches, either Trinity or uh, King's Chapel in, in downtown Boston. Dudley lives on Walter Street from 1721 to 1749. He is a representative of Roxbury in the Great and General Court. He's a speaker of the House uh, of the Massachusetts Legislature. And he got the title of Colonel from this, his service in the Suffolk County Regiment that fought in wars with French Canada. And when he was only 20 years old, just graduated from Harvard, he's sent as the representative to Canada to negotiate the release of prisoners of war that uh, were being held for uh, by the French Canadians. And he successfully negotiates the release of, of many, including the minister of the Deerfield Church. William Dudley, uh, farm did better than others because he had slaves on his farm. He inherited Jimmy from his parents and he also purchased Flora, Caesar, Peter, and Quam. He built this mansion uh, at the end of his property, actually a little past Walter Street, where South and Walworth come together. And at the time, Walworth Street was known as Dudley Street. I found that on an old map. So starting from his house here, Walworth Street heads up across Rosendale and was for a time known as Dudley Street. Now, if you're familiar with these unusual Paul Dudley marking stones, Paul Dudley, Thomas's, uh, William's brother, uh, was a noted jurist and also set out these stones at mile markings from Beacon Hill in Boston. Now this one is right at the intersection of Allendale and Center Street, and it's hidden in the wall right by the traffic light there. 
you'll also see one, there's one by the monument. There's others in many major roads out of Boston are the Paul Dudley stones that were put in. So that's why it says distance from Boston, Paul Dudley and the stone installed in 1735. Now, amongst the other settlers in this area, you have uh, the Winchesters have a have a farm here. This shows the Dudley name here. The minister of the church, Bradford, builds a home here in 1789, has 10 and a half acres on on this area that's between South and and Walter Street, where like Sim Street and Tappan Street. Uh, uh, are in the neighborhood today. And in this section where Peters Hill is, was Mr. Davis's farm. And I'm going to mention that again in a few minutes. Next to the church was the Walter Street burying ground. That's why there are graves on the Arboretum, because there had been a church and a burying ground associated with it uh, in that area. Amongst the graves are the grave of Sarah Chamberlain, and the oldest house still in existence in Rosendale is the Chamberlain House, built in 1725. It's over on Poplar Street, and they owned much of the area of, around Poplar Street, uh, up from Washington back towards Poplar Street, right by Walter Street. By the where there's the flag, is a monument for the the soldiers from the Revolutionary War who died in the hospitals in Jamaica Plain, mo, uh, most particularly in the what's the Loring Greeno House today. That was used as a hospital after uh, and also as the headquarters for Nathaniel Green, who had who held General Green was from Rhode Island and had Rhode Island troops stationed there to keep the British bottled up in Boston when they were occupying Boston. But as Jamaica Plain developed, they uh, needed to move those graves, so they were removed to this burying ground, and that's why the marker is here. Later on, when Walter Street is widened, uh, some of the graves are relocated from from there back up on the hill, uh, but it's it's noted that they that's where they were. Most of these soldiers died of smallpox. So physically, Peters Hill, where the graveyard is, and we if you imagine having walked through the graveyard and out of the top of Peters Hill, is is this little double rise here. It's a glacial drumming. So it's a remnant of a glacier moving this way and coming upon an obstacle, and then as it retreats, leaving debris there and leaving a hill. Peters Hill is 235 feet, the highest uh, hill in the Arboretum, and was on Joseph Davis's farm, which uh, is a later acquisition of Benjamin Bussey and is added to the Arboretum in 1894. And after Benjamin Bussey dies, his heirs, the Motleys, take over this area. And so that some people in our neighborhood know this as Motley's Hill. And then in 1904, it's renamed for former mayor and uh, legislator from the area, uh, Andrew James Peters, he had an interesting time as mayor. He served only one term. He was preceded by James Michael Curley and then becomes mayor in 1917. Is mayor when there's a noted policeman strike that he tries to negotiate and then the governor Calvin Coolidge steps in and uh, and undo undoes the settlement that Peter did, Peters did, and uh, becomes noted for his handling of 
trying to push down the strike. Uh, and by 1920, he's so noted that he's added to the Republican ticket as the vice presidential candidate for, uh, for Warren Harding uh, and then succeeds him as president. But because of all the problems with the Boston police strike, Andrew Peters does not get reelected and he's succeeded by James Michael Curley, who he had defeated in the Democratic primary in 1917, and then Curley defeats him in 1919. But that's where it gets the name Peters Hill. Now from Peters Hill, we walk to, towards the center of what is the Benjamin Bussey estate. So I had pointed out on the map where Eliezer Weld had his farm. And Benjamin Bussey, after Eliezer Weld dies, Benjamin Bussey buys 50 acres from Eliezer Weld's widow to create a retirement. He wants to retire to the country. So he wants to build a country estate to retire to. So who is Benjamin Bussey? Benjamin Bussey was a young man who grew up in a farm in what's today Canton, but was part of the town of Stoughton at the time. His father was off as a sea captain and he lived with his grandparents on their farm. And then when the captain retired and bought his own farm, he's, he helps his father with the farm and with the country store that his father ran. And he starts to get into the to trading and he be, he's very successful at that. And then when the revolution happens, he steps in and this is a cartoon from the bicentennial. Uh, Rosendale resident Benjamin Bussey fought many battles and traveled far and accumulated a fortune. But it was at age 18, he distinguished himself with his daring by stealing British livestock off the islands of British Harbor under the orders of the Continental Army. So. He then goes on to uh, provide the territory for the Arboretum. And here's a picture of him later in life. Um, he then, um, after this exploit, comes down with smallpox. But he rejoins the, um, he re-enlists re and is, is a participant of the um, campaign at Ticonderoga and at Saratoga. For Saratoga, he becomes the quartermaster for the Massachusetts forces and starts making merchant contacts with lots of businesses. He knew how to acquire uh, goods from his experience with the country store, and he does well at that. After the war, he hires a Hessian soldier who had decided not to return to Prussia uh, after the war, but uh, to live in the United States. To teach him, to teach Bussey the silversmithing craft. And so they set up a silversmith shop in Dedham and it does well. He eventually, the side goods that he's selling out of the silversmith shop starts to do better than uh, the silversmithing itself. So he, Benjamin Bussey, leaves the silversmith shop and becomes a trader uh, in goods. He does well, so well that uh, by the 1790s, he has $25,000 and he moves to Boston where he acquires his first ship, the Franklin. He then, establishes a fleet that becomes 15 ships. He sets up his brother, his younger brother in London to, for transatlantic trade and has this fleet of ships. They ship goods back and forth across the Atlantic. He, there's correspondence about buying rib, fancy ribbons from Belgium and bringing those back and other goods. But also at that time, he starts moving uh, finished goods to the south of the United States 
and bringing back cotton from the that was grown by slaves to the mills in Massachusetts and um, also makes money off of uh, the products that were uh, derived by enslaved peoples. So in that way, his his fortune is a little tainted. He also is an investor in properties. He owns large tracts in uh, in Maine, including what becomes Bangor, Maine, and that adds to his wealth as well. When his brother dies, uh, he decides to get out of that some of the uh, this business, and by 1806 he decides to start looking into his retirement farm. So he had lived at Five Summer Street in Boston. That's at the intersection of Summer and Arch Streets, where there's a 7-Eleven today, but he had a five-story mansion there and was noted for his business contacts and for uh, hosting many gentlemen to the times. He was also known for his generosity and helping people. He uh, assisted the widow of General Henry Knox, who he knew from the service and in her retire and after General Knox died, he set up uh, doctors who went off to become amongst the first doctors in the territory of Michigan. And then he decides to retire. And so he buys that property from Eliezer Weld. this property here, and then starts acquiring other properties. He buys, by 1837, he buys John Davis's property. Uh, he buys John Morey's pasture. He buys uh, pasture from the Winchesters and starts putting together an estate. His estate is eventually called Woodland Hill and eventually has over 300 acres. I mentioned the Winchester family, their house, um, he acquires the uh, pasture land that they have across Center Street, but their house is here on Center Street. Maybe you can recognize it from driving up and down Center Street. Um, when I first started attending the my church in Jamaica Plain, Ellsworth Winchester was one of the still one of the active members of that church. He was in his 80s uh, and had relatives that had been part of that church since the 1820s. And he grew up in this house and said, it was a drafty old house to grow up in. <laughs> so originally, this is a painting of Benjamin Bussey's house. He retires here in 1815. This is a picture from about 1839, and much of the land has been lumbered off. Only Hemlock Hill still had trees on it. It's such a rugged spot and difficult to um, to work on and not beneficial for farmland. So that those are some of the oldest trees in the arboretum because they. Uh, were not lumbered off like much of the rest of the Arboretum was. This is what we know as Bussey Hill today. Mr. Bussey, who lived here with some of his outbuildings here, uh, ref still knew it as Weld Hill. Uh, he settles here. He becomes a member of the first, the, the Jamaica Plain Church. He begins the plantings of lilacs. And he starts raising black merino sheep and and experimenting with reforestation and other uh, country estate sort of things as a retired man on his country estate. Here's the remnants of his mansion um, in the Arboretum today. It's on the side of Bussy Hill. And he put an observatory up on the top of the hill 
here he had two telescopes and and several couches where he would entertain people by bringing them up they'd hike up the hill the observatory and check out the sky and the views of the city and from Bussy Hill. Later generations would change the mansion and change the style, uh, put it in the Second Empire style and add some porches. And this stayed in location, it stayed there until 1942. Another view of the Bussy Farm. He also had farm buildings on South Street at 644 South Street. Uh, there's an, a big stone house that's noted as a part of the Bussy Farm. Then he decides to donate in his will much of this property and he establishes at Harvard that <clears throat> The um, this property is to go to Harvard. He also plays uh, funds a professorship in botany, he a professorship in divinity, and he sets in motion that there's going to be an agriculture college in Jamaica Plain. So you can see the Bussey Institution was set up in 1871 to be an agriculture college of Harvard in Jamaica Plain, and is so for 70 years. A provision of the will was that his uh, widow and heirs could continue to live at Woodland Hill until they died. And so he dies in 1842, but most of this doesn't happen until the 1870s when they decide uh, to release the land for the Bussey Institution. So the Bussey Institution of Harvard University is begun in 1871 uh, and teaches agriculture. An interesting side tale is that one of the most famous students of the Bussey Institute was the son of the minister at the First Church in Jamaica Plain, Charles Fletcher Dole. His son, James Drummond Dole, grows up in Jamaica Plain as the preacher's kid and goes to the, to the local school right here in Jamaica Plain and gets a degree in agriculture. He had cousins who were missionaries in Hawaii, and he moves off to Hawaii and starts the pineapple company because in his neighborhood, there was an agriculture college, the Bussey Institute. So. In our wanderings, we walked from Peters Hill over to where the the uh, foundation of the old Bussy House was, Woodland Hill, and then um, just a short distance there. After that, there's the pic. We um, you could see we could walk over to where the uh, Bussy Bridge was, where there was the famous bridge collapse in. March 14th, 1887, which brought lots of people out to see the collapse who discovered Rosendale. And legend has it that the, soon thereafter, there was a building boom and property sales of everyone finding that, hey, Rosendale's a nice looking place to live. 